killing it with the background over here. We need to we need to all <laughs> level up the virtual background. Thanks so much, Chris. Have a great combo, ladies. Thank you. Hello, brand innovators, virtual audience out there. Thank you so much for staying on and for staying on with us. And if you're just tuning in, thank you so much for joining us. We have an awesome session all day today. Um, so super excited to speaking with a ton of awesome leaders at really amazing brands. As a reminder, I'm Tiffany Pettit, Director of Strategic Partnerships over at Influential. We're an LA-based social data and conversion company specializing in showcasing the effectiveness of influencer campaigns, like measuring attribution, in-store sales, tune in attribution, foot traffic, you name it. And today, all about these women right here, we have a duo of women at uh, two amazing brands, Christine Hunt, who's the head of media at Elf Beauty, and Alicia Smalls-Worthington, who's the senior brand director of marketing and e-com at Scotch Porter. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for being here, ladies. Hello. Awesome. <laughs> so I want to kick it off um, and, and start by really calling out the fact that we have um, two brands with very unique and different audiences as it relates to primary female consumer, primary male consumer. And um, it's been quite a ride, I'm sure, for both of you when it comes to uh, 2020 in general. You know, Elf Beauty being a legendary Gen Z millennial makeup and beauty brand, and then Scotch Porter really hitting the deck and being uh, a disruptive men's grooming brand in the space. Um, I want to start with Alicia and talk about what this year has been like for you. I know you just launched in retail locations. Um, give me, give us some insight into what your social strategy has been this year, and has there been sort of a change when it comes to driving e-com versus retail, given what your consumers mm -hmm. are asking for? Yeah, great question. So I think for us, you know, we all have plans going into uh, the new year. So in 19, we're like in 2020, if this is happening, you know, this is going down. And then of course, COVID happened. I think the beauty of being a primarily a direct to consumer brand is that you can be agile, especially being a startup, you know, we're a small team. There's lots of nimbleness, flexibility. Um, there, mo most of us, I always say we're all Swiss Army knives, right? We're doing 27 things to make all the magic happen. And so I think retail, actually, this was perfect timing for us to expand into retail because once COVID happened, you kind of wanted to be where the consumer was. And so with things that from a logistical standpoint on the back end, you know, dot com, people are purchasing, you know, we get the order out the door, but then, you know, UPS and USPS and FedEx, everyone kind of had like their logistical hiccups just because of the state of what was going on. I think so for us, what we saw was not only folks going into store when stores were open, open um, as far as picking up our product, we also saw um, a huge uptick in people actually purchasing grooming care. I mean, at the end of the day, self-care has always been a priority for us. We've stuck a pin in wellness years ago because we feel like, you know, anyone can make lotions and potions, but at the end of the day, we want to really be identified as a wellness brand to really help internally and externally groom him. And so with barbershops being closed, you know, it kind of forced him to really bring the barbershop and his overall grooming home. And so we had a huge uptick in not only our beard care, but our hair care, our face care. And we continue to see that trend in that the same direction in terms of people making sure that they're stocking up. Because I think even with uh, grooming spaces like barbershops opening back up, the consumer is still kind of hesitant to, you know, add that back full time into their routine. No, that makes perfect sense. And you make a great point. I mean, talk about the number of YouTube videos I've actually invested in and to try to do my own, you know, hair, makeup, all of that. Um, that makes a ton mm -hmm. of sense. And I know thinking about social, Christine, Elf Beauty has been in a variety of different places. Your consumer is ready for any kind of content that you're putting out there. How have those social strategies shifted in any way since the pandemic announcements and everything else going on now? Tell us a little bit about that. Totally. I mean, I think um, for us, it's, social is, is such a key part of beauty, right? It's such a key part of our business. For us, it is vital because we put our customer first. The customer is the heart of everything we do. For us, it's about listen, learning, and leading. And social gives us the ability to tap right into our community, right into our most passionate consumers. Um, so social was always a big part of our business previously. 
right? Um, leading up to this, um, we were focused really on reconnecting with our consumers via social, making sure that the content really related to them. Um, so we did a brand recharge June of last year. And with that brand recharge, it was really founded in data. So we had taken a look at our, you know, our historical data and noticed that we were losing relevance with our consumer. We took that as an opportunity to recharge the brand and tap back into really what our superpowers were, right? We can deliver OMG prices uh, and unbelievable qualities at those prices. Um, so we are we are a fun brand. We have this playful wink. So we infused that back into our creative. We took a look at what our community, how our community was talking to each other, wanted to talk to them as a friend, created this almost like memeable content. Um, so some of our ads that you may have seen are like some of these dogs to show that we are vegan and cruelty free. Their hair is getting blown away, Farrah Fawcett style in the wind. And it says that feeling when you learn that Elf is vegan and cruelty free. So by leveraging the way that our community speaks and also listening um, to their concerns, we were able to bring forward these superpowers in a way that truly related to them. Now we've diversified across the social platforms and we always wanna to talk to our consumers in the way that they are willing to engage in those platforms. So that's always top of mind for us. We're really social platform agnostic. It's really being there to remove the friction and to assist our community. Um, I think another favorite story of mine is just how we truly listen to our community. Uh, so with social, there is social listening, right? And you know, all of us in the marketing team, our whole our whole company, and even our CMO reads not even dozens, but I would say like hundreds to thousands of social comments on a regular basis, just trying to understand, you know, really what are those concerns? And we even pull them with um, with social, with Instagram, with Facebook, trying to get a sense of where their concerns are. One example of that is with one of our hero products, um, which you guys may have heard of. It's our 16 hour camo concealer. Um, it's phenomenal coverage uh, and an unbeatable price again. But when we came out with it, while we got a lot of love, we also had some feedback that said, oh gosh, I wish you guys would come out with a hydrating version, right? Like it's very matte. I have dry skin, doesn't always work that well. And so we went to work right away on this. Um, we had released the camo concealer uh, January of 2019. And by January of 2020, it was already available for purchase in the hydrating formula. So really, really fast innovation, truly like doubling down on what our consumers are telling us. Um, and it was a risky move because with a lot of brands like ours, if they're gonna come out with one product, which is your OG product, and then come out with the next product, um, there is a risk of cannibalization, but we were really thrilled to find that it's listening to our consumers. We didn't really see that cannibalization. Sales remain steady on the first um, and continued to grow with the second. So really, really happy there. We're actually seeing people are using this product um, you know, with combination skin. So in some areas, they're gonna use it to conceal. In some areas, they might even use a darker shade to contour. And really, they're just using the right formulation for that part of their face. I mean, you make you make a great point, and both of you kind of said this in 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 one way. Understanding how you need to be authentic and listening to what your consumers are asking for, and be adaptable when it comes to even putting out a standard social media post, or you know, making sure that you're having the right messaging in any of your, I'm sure, like email newsletters and things like that. Um, what role, when I think about authenticity, it automatically makes me think about influencers and their people, you know, trying to form really authentic relationships with them. Um, could be even two brands that you're looking to partner with or another brand that you're looking to partner with in the most authentic way. What role has have influencers played in your strategies? And has it been very much so like a reactive relationship or are you sourcing, you know, the right fits? Alicia, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So when it comes to influencer um, marketing, we it is a channel for us, right? So it's not an afterthought. It's a primary channel, not secondary. Um, when our founder, Calvin Salas, founded the brand five years ago before having a, a marketing budget or it being coined this influencer marketing, you know, I was laughing, say influencer marketing is the, the new black, right? Now everything is like, oh, it's influencer marketing, you know, but ultimately it's taking that whole word of mouth that most of us have experienced throughout our childhood and even adulthood and it now being 
um, in the digital form. And so we look at folks who wouldn't traditionally be coined as influencers, um, but also those who are macro influencers, how do you tap into some of these secondary attributes um, that they express? And how do, you, how do you layer your brand and to work with that? So for example, as I mentioned earlier, we're a wellness brand, right? So we're not necessarily as a primary sort of descriptor looking at guys who have a beard, right? I think that's just the first go-to low-hanging fruit search. However, there could be secondary uh, verticals such as gaming, where the guy is actually gaming and he has a luscious beard or amazing skin or amazing hair. How do we now work with that gentleman? Because I think at the end of the day, you want to tap into what they're interested in because that's going to make them advocate for your brand even more. And you also want to make sure that they work well together, right? We like to say, I like to say, play nice in a sandbox. And so when I think about the ethos or the overall persona of the Scotch Porter man, he does love to work out. He is a family guy. He may be a foodie, you know? He can be a blue collar worker just as much as a white collar worker. And so in identifying our influencers, it really isn't a one size fit all. And I think that's where a lot of brands go wrong. You know, trying to put that circle in a square. As Christine mentioned earlier about influencer, like meeting these influencers sort of where they are and leveraging, and even your consumers, leveraging social and listening to them, it's the same thing that we do with our influencers. Influencers have come to us with ideas when it comes to our product roadmap. They're the first to get their hands on product samples, like, hey, we're coming out with X. How does it hydrate? Do you like the touch and feel of it? Do you like the scent, the fragrance profile? And so I think influencers work harder and smarter for you when they really feel like there's a genuine partnership. And I think it's important to not look at your influencer strategy, as I mentioned earlier, as one size fit all, but really segment it. You know, who are these top 100 that you work with? And what makes them qualify to be in the top 100? And what are the special perks that they get by being a part of your top 100? Whereas the other uh, crew members, you know, it's more brand awareness. It's more scale. It's more share of voice. And so I think when you learn to break your influencer strategy apart and kind of uh, project things where applicable, that's when you drive the most success out of it. And that's what we've learned to date. I think you make a really great point. And this is so exciting to hear that this is coming from you both as marketers is that there one there isn't one size fits all. And the fact that there is a variety of influencers to select from now, I think back in the day, it was kind of like, there's your fashion, there's your beauty. And like, there we go. We have so many niche markets now when it comes to influencers. And then even two fashion influencers may have very different audiences that we can tap into. So that's super exciting to know that you guys are thinking the same way. You know, it's about being authentic. It's about choosing the right one, not just one for, for the sake of it. We wholeheartedly agree with that as well. Um, and then, so for Christine, when it comes to influencers, definitely you guys have, you know, touched them in, in different ways um, across different platforms and things like that. Um, but then there's also a paid media component that you may have also used in, in tandem with the influencer efforts. Can you take us through what that looks like? Our influencer is very much so like a upper funnel media um, partner of yours, or do they do they really fall um, in in your marketing mix in a lower funnel capacity? Well, uh, it's it's actually both. <laughs> so the yeah, really has to be. <laughs> Similar to Alicia, really, it's it's not taking this one size fits all approach. So for us, uh, we revamped our influencer strategy not too long ago to really have this full funnel approach, right? Um, very much to Alicia's point, you're going to have your megas, and they're going to have their place for your brand. But really, there's you can't forget about the micro influencers, the up and coming influencers in different spaces, right? So like my influencers that we work with in in TikTok are very different. From the type of content you're going to see in Instagram, right? Different audience, different content, and you can't use the same influencer across every single platform. So with our full funnel strategy, we actually um, work with Magic Links uh, to create this like always on program that really helps us pick influencers that will fill each part of the funnel. So both the awareness and the reach, really that reach and frequency. What is their engagement? Like how how many followers do they have? How many active followers? Uh, what's the engagement rate on the most recent post that they've been doing? Um, just to make sure that we're really staying data focused in our partnerships. 
So that's one part of it is really focusing on the data. The other part is focusing on the relationship, right? So again, you can't spread yourself too thin across all of these. You do need to focus in on who are the influences that truly reflect, reflect your core demographic and really strengthen those relationships there. Uh, and then we have our micro influencers, which are really sort of the ones to watch. Um, I think they're the ones who are up and coming. Um, they're very scrappy. They're excited to work with a the brand. They truly have this strong passion that comes through for the brand. Uh, so for those that we definitely partner closely with Magic Links to understand both the data aspect and also help us maintain that relationship with them, um, being that our, our team is also small and nimble. Um, so they are an extension of our team. Um, but very, very excited with how influencers have just the whole strategy has changed, I think, for a lot of brands, and I love the direction that it's taken. I agree. I agree. It's just everyone's getting smarter and more information is coming, whether we like it or not, and it's just about being smarter about your business. Um, when it comes to, I kind of want to shift gears a little bit, um, because I know both of you have um, had awesome responses when it comes to uh, COVID, when it comes to social injustices that have happened, and again, listening to your consumers and listening or thinking about ways to show up as a brand. Um, Alicia, do you want to talk about some of the things that you've done as a brand or the company has done as a brand in response to social injustices that have happened um, or anything that has happened on the COVID front? Yeah, no, great question. So, you know, we are a Black-owned brand. Um, our founder started this business and um, he owned a barbershop, noticed a recurring issue when it came to predominantly African-American men having dry, frizzy hair and beards. Um, the barbershop was located in Newark, New Jersey, and he really used that like as his incubation ground to kind of prove out the product and fast forward, launched the website, word spread like wildfire, and fast forward, here we are five years later um, with distribution in Target, Walmart, Amazon, over 140 barbershops and boutiques um, across the U.S. And so all that to say the black and brown consumer is absolutely a very much so a part of our ecosystem um, we service kinky coily textured wavy hair which usually happens to be the the hair profile especially with beards and hair for african-american hispanic racially ambiguous you know men and so for us with the whole covid and just the overall movement happening we wanted to make sure that we were a voice um, and that we came to the forefront as a brand to show our support for how our consumers are feeling um, and that we are, you know, alongside with them. And so we've donated to a series of the different causes that are helping in the inner city because what we feel is we want to work with, we wanted to work with folks who are on the ground. And so we want to make sure that the way our products touch, you know, consumers' lives, that, we're, we, that we were innate able to, excuse me, enable organizations within their hometowns to help them to service their needs. And then we also um, have an anti-odor uh, cleansing wipe that's helpful for all sensitive areas. And so we donated thousands, about 25,000 of those wipes to different hospitals um, and um, shelters across the New Jersey, New York, uh, tri-state area. And so that's when we found our place in sort of making sure that we're a part of the conversation, but it being selfless and not selfish, because ultimately what we want to do is make sure that we're empowering our customers. You know, it's about supporting them during times like these as well. Yeah, you make a great or you make a great point. Um, and again, just awesome to hear and give some examples on what that looks like um, from a brand, you know, of, of all different types of verticals. Um, Christine, do you want to touch on that from uh, from Elf's perspective? Yes, definitely happy to. I, I think there are a few um, buckets here. So one would be COVID and, and how that changed our business. Um, obviously, it, it, it changed everyone's business. COVID has changed everything. So from a business perspective, we saw this flood of traffic onto e-commerce and we were seeing consumers that we typically hadn't before, right? Consumers who typically went in store weren't used to shopping online. So we had to start listening even closer and changing our strategy. So I remember at the time we were launching a campaign um, that was about, um, about new lip products that we were coming out with and it kind of had this edgier feel to it, mouth off. 
didn't really seem um, to be the right message at that time, felt a little tone deaf. We definitely changed and pivoted our messaging, making sure that our messaging was focused on self-care, health, wellness, skincare. Our brand messaging, what we did is we took um, our, our famous song on TikTok um, and we remixed that song with the artist, the original artist, uh, to create this health PSA about washing your hands and staying clean during that time, just to add some levity and some lightheartedness to it, but still get a very important message out there. So that's the business aspect of it. Um, in addition to how we address COVID with just our employees and our consumers, um, consumers, we we definitely we made donations. We also uh, added free hand sanitizer. So uh, we got into production, created hand sanitizer, and quickly put that in all of the boxes of anyone who ordered. So typically, we always have a free gift with purchase um, at around a twenty-five dollar threshold. Now we were just adding in to anyone who ordered this free hand sanitizer. For employees, Elf actually gave employees um, free like Clorox disinfecting wipes. Everyone just like signed up on a sign up sheet internally. We got wipes, we got masks, we got gloves. Um, masks were donated. Um, so really, really proud of how we showed up in that area. Um, now when it comes to the social injustice, again, very proud of how our company did show up at this moment. So donated to Color of Change, which is one of the largest um, organizations, nonprofit organizations that's fighting um, this injustice. We also had really important dialogue and training. So um, we had like social um, behaviors of inclusion training, sensitivity training, everyone went through it. We had important dialogue coming from our leaders, our CEO, sent out weekly emails about how important this change was. Um, our CFO wrote a really compelling, powerful article um, about this as well. And then um, we donated uh, and even matched all employee donations to uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, NAACP, Campaign Zero, and I'm sure I'm forgetting one more. Um, but again, just really did not hesitate. And even from a business perspective, we shut down um, our, our entire site for Black Tuesday and we celebrated Juneteenth as a national health holiday. Awesome. I, I, I mean, checking the boxes, I, I feel lucky to have had both of you guys available for this day to share these insights because no matter your size as a company, no matter, you know, your market, your audience, there's something to do as a brand um, because we're all going through this together. We're living in the same country. We're experiencing the same thing. So I think that's really important. So thank you guys for sharing on that, um, sharing about what you're doing in general on that front. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, innovation, and we touched on it a little bit, listening to consumers, listening to what your audiences want and need. What do you think innovation looks like, even thinking ahead to holiday? It's going to be a high time for, for both of you. Um, Alicia, is there anything that um, is in the works that you can disclose when it comes to innovating in this space, and um, what do you guys have upcoming for holiday? Yeah, no, great question. So I cannot disclose the <laughs> items. Darn. But I will, oh, all good. Listen, I appreciate the question. Um, I do, I will say this, you know, to Christine's point, I think that's one of the things that the brand has really uh, been founded on and done well, and that's really uh, building these relationships with our consumers. You know, that's why we were prim primarily direct to consumer for so long, because we really wanted these 320,000 gentlemen that we service to feel like they have a line in. To ask us, one time we've, we've, we survey them all the time and have conversations, our founder even calls them up to get like their opinions and certain things and just temperature checks. But all that to say, one time we did a survey and we asked gentlemen, like, who taught you how to groom? And a lot of them either said no one or their moms, you know? And so that's a real honest response, but it's also an, an opportunity for us as a brand to educate them on wellness, educate them on how to use our product based on, you know, their hair types, et cetera. And so always having that soundboard and that open door policy in terms of like, what else do you need? You know, when you go to the drugstore and when you're at home, you know, like what's a pain point? Because that's what our brand is founded on. You know, even though we over-index in servicing African-American, Hispanic men, et cetera, 
um, it's really solutions oriented, right? So what, what problem are we solving? So a lot of the products that we're launching this holiday and also Q1, super exciting on our dot-com, but also in-store um, innovation really led by white space in the market, but also really solving pain points that men face daily. And so going category deep, um, not necessarily wide. And so we're super excited about adding new offerings in our beard, our hair care, our face care, and we'll be launching them starting this holiday. So lots going on, as you can imagine, it's like we're off to the races, and I know I'm pretty much preaching to the choir, but everyone's like in holiday mode. I'm like, the fun is over, um, but really <laughs> looking forward to what the holiday brings us, because I think to Christine's point, a lot of folks who may historically have not been dot-com shoppers are now coming online, and because of just the way outside is set up, um, we'll continue to do so. So excited to see what new trends and insights we get out of um, this holiday. I mean, I agree. This is my way of trying to get our audience a little piece, a little snackable insight <laughs> on anything coming up. I'll, I'll have to ask Christine, is there anything you can disclose um, when it comes to holiday or just the way that you're thinking about um, the future of products and, and what else is doing as a brand even? Sure. So, uh, similar to Lisa, I can't speak to the products, um, but I can <laughs> give you guys some guidance just in terms of how we're thinking about holiday and how other marketers might want to think about it. I mean, at least I hit the nail on the head where it is, it is all about reducing that friction, right? Sort of like solving for a pain point, assisting your consumer in their journey. So I think <clears throat> the holiday, it's just thinking about how different this one is compared to previous holidays, right? Um, so I would, you know, I'm betting that gifting is actually going to be bigger than ever with this holiday, right? Think about this year. We've all been socially distanced from our friends, from our loved ones. We're longing for that sense of connection and these like fun little unexpected prizes that show up at our doors are a way to reconnect with loved ones. So I do think that gifting is going to be better, bigger than ever. I do think that skincare and self-care and wellness is going to be bigger than ever. Um, and also it's going to be earlier, right? So I think with this holiday season, we know the election is coming as well. Uh, we know that there is a lot of noise around that. Now, historically, in previous elections, I can just say anecdotally from other brands that I've worked with, from other client accounts I've had, I've seen when it's an election year, you usually uh, see decreased traffic around that time, right? That's not where people's mind is focused. They're not focused on shopping. They're focused on that. So a lot of times when that happens, the shopping will happen later, right after that election, right in that, like, period before like Christmas and holiday, um, which if it's an e-commerce world, that really puts a strain on our business because we want to try to get product there before your last day to ship. And now with so many more people shopping online because of COVID, um, it's going to be added strain on a lot of the distributors, right? It's going to be an added strain on a lot of delivery. So I would think about starting earlier than ever this year. I know, I feel like holiday always moves earlier and earlier and earlier. It's <laughs> like going to be May <laughs> next year. <laughs> <laughs> to make sure that, you know, you can make sure that you are maintaining that quality experience for your consumers, that they're having a good experience with your brand because a lot of them are shopping online with you for the first time ever this holiday. Um, yeah. And make sure that you can stabilize your business. Yeah, that makes Absolutely. a lot of sense. I love that you were able to even give us that much. Um, before we head into some questions that are coming from the audience, I do want to ask, similar to what you're thinking about holiday, I want to know from a 2021 predictions in your respective verticals, thinking about makeup and beauty, thinking about personal care, what are your predictions when it comes to these specific categories? Um, and this could be not just for your brand, but just for the vertical itself. Alicia, do you have any predictions? Yeah, well, hmm. I would say, you know, when it comes to men's grooming, just what I've seen over the, the last five years or so, it, it kind of actually speaks to social and like the influencer sphere. Um, when you, especially when it comes to males, I think, you know, on when it comes to women, they've kind of started the trend with influencer marketing and, you know, showing the unboxings, et cetera. And then when a lot of the men started to get into it, you would see, you know, 
hey, this is my finished look, you know, but it's like, but how did you achieve that look? And so fast forward last year, and especially during COVID, I started to see a lot more male influencers kind of like pick that armor off and allow you into the overall grooming process. Now that grooming could be beard care, hair care, face care. It could even be their workouts. It, it breaks down to what they're eating, you know, but really taking people on their social journey. And I think that that's gonna continue into 2021 in terms of expression. Like what's your fashion expression? You know, what's your self-expression? And I think as brands, we have to make sure that our, our products, our services, our tools to help consumers with what they want to express in the world. And I think not to toot our own horns, but I think Christine and even, uh, and Elf, excuse me, Christine, Elf, um, myself, Scotch Porter, my founder, you know, we kind of have already saw that, we saw that, we see it coming and kind of thinking about how do we continue, we always say internally to arm men with the tools they need to live their best lives. And so going into 2021 and beyond, that's what we want to continue to do because having those tools, possessing them and knowing how to use them is more important now than ever because normal, this is normal now, right? What we knew before isn't. So men understanding how to groom themselves, how to take care of their hair, how to shave, how to use a trimmer, that's not going away because we never know when something like this could happen again. And as the saying goes, if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. And so I think 2021 is it's all about everyone staying armed to be their best self. I love that because I have learned so much just by watching, you know, the ins and outs of what makes a haircut, what it does. I have a boyfriend and I'm really trying to get in there and be his barber, but I'm like, I really don't know. So having a, a wealth of social videos just pop up and men are actually willing just like, hey, this is this is me in COVID. This is me after. That's going to be super exciting to hear across that category specifically. Um, Christine, Absolutely. what do you think? What are some of your predictions in makeup and beauty? Yeah, so I think um, it kind of goes back to what Alicia was saying about how, you know, th their insight that they found was it, a lot of men didn't actually have anyone teaching them how to grow. I think education is going to be huge, right? So we're seeing this uh, this thirst for more product knowledge, right? We've been seeing this over time where like people are, they're reading the labels a little bit more. And I think it's really also has started with a lot of influencers. Hey, how is this product supposed to work? What's going into this product, right? Like, let me peek behind the curtain. But now that we're in this world of increased heightened concern around health, and wellness, I think people are taking even more attention. So it's not just the influencer community or the mega beauty junkies who's really looking at all of these ingredients and wanting to know what should go in there, what shouldn't, how should I use this? I think it's gonna, you know, it's translating over to the everyday consumer. Consumers are expecting more. They want transparency in their product. They want performance in their product. They want products that are gonna be like this hybrid, right? So in, in beauty, what we're seeing is a lot of desire for products that are gonna be makeup plus skincare, right? Rather than just covering it up. Let's let's actually make me, you know, make it better, improve the texture. So I think that's gonna be something that we're seeing a lot more and a huge focus on clean beauty. Yeah, I agree. I'm ready for it just uh, as a consumer for both of you guys. <laughs> I'm very ready for it. Um, let's take it to some questions. There's one question that's popping up. Did you have a professional mentor early on in your career? And I'd even go a step further to say, to ask if there's any advice that you've gotten from said mentor um, that's really impacted your journey now and um, where you are in your company, and even personally, I'd say. Anyone want to jump in with Felicia? Yeah, so I um, I would say I've had a lot of non-traditional uh, mentors. Um, what I mean by that is, especially with, I, I started my career in 2000, right, before digital was a thing, before it exploded. And so fast forward as the digital sphere continued to grow, I leaned in on social media by following people who I wanted my conversation to feel like, you know, my professionalism to feel like, and, you know, and looking at that, what they were projecting, what their content uh, looked and felt like, and how it worked for me. And so when it comes to mentoring, I 
read a ton of things. I actually wor work a lot in parallel with folks like you who are my peers um, to ask questions and volley ideas, you, you know, back and forth. And so to me, when, when I think of mentorship, I think it's important. I'm always speaking at different events. Um, I always, if someone asks me to review something, you know, I always lean in because it's important to throw the rope behind us to help people, you know, get in and get over. I wish someone who looked like me um, a lot of early on, especially when I started my career, especially when I think of, you know, black and brown individuals, you know, there weren't a ton of us in digital marketing. And so you already were like, you know, the, the stepchild, but then on top of that, digital also is one of those things where people are like, wait, what do you mean, uh, Google <laughs> Analytics, you know? So I felt like a fish in upstream for a long time, um, but not anymore, because now we live in a data-driven world. And I think when we think about even our lives, um, how does data apply to our lives? So how can we leverage data to make it actually work for us outside of our professional selves? And I think mentorship should fall in that same bucket, you know, looking at networking events. So why do you want to be this person's friend? How do they lend themselves to where you're trying to get to? And what, what do you have to offer in this networking slash mentorship uh, situation? So I love mentors, love mentees, but I don't necessarily have a mentor. But a word of advice I will say that I did receive from one of my former colleagues, um, CMO of one of the companies, COO, excuse me, one of the companies I used to work at. It actually was in relation to me being married. He said, be sure to fall in love over and over again um, in terms of like keeping your relationship healthy. But I think that also applies to your, your work, your professionalism, right? It's important to fall in love with it over and over again. Find new ways to re-engage. Find new ways to, to cause people to react, you know? And so I would give that advice to anyone, whether you're in the marketing space, you know, influencer space, et cetera, um, fall in love with it over and over again. I love that. I love that so much. I have no words, <laughs> Christine. <laughs> not to not to not to, not to have you not to have you follow that up. <laughs> I will say I was laughing to myself when you said it. You know the what is Google Analytics and no one understands what data marketing is. Even my parents today don't understand exactly what I do. So I tell them I buy clicks on the internet. <laughs> but uh, I think in terms of mentorship, it's um, it's you know it's it's so important. But also just you know to Lisa's point, it's really about creating um, that sense of community with your colleagues. Um, so for me, I did have a really important mentor starting out, the late Mary Jane O'Keefe, um, and she wasn't even a mentor in, in digital marketing. She was in one of my first jobs, uh, which was like in risk management for real estate. <laughs> And she just, she had a way of seeing people's superpowers and seeing the beauty beyond just your technical skills, right? And so she really, her advice to me was to nurture those skills outside of your career because you'll be surprised how much they actually come into play later and influence the, your career. So really it was focusing on the soft skills that like she wrote poetry and I would write, you know, some short stories and poetry, we'd share that together and really had this camaraderie and gave her, you know, each other encouragement and feedback. And she was the one who told me like, you know, you wanted to go into digital marketing, you, like you have to do this. I'd love to keep you here, but that's it. this isn't where you're meant to be. So I think having a person like that early on in my career was so instrumental to my success. That is Love awesome it. advice. Thank you both so much. I mean, there's so many nuggets. We can go on for days. I didn't even touch the surface on the <laughs> amount of questions I wanted to ask you guys, but I think you left the audience with a lot of great insights and thank you for being so candid about it. So appreciate you both. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you guys. You're welcome. Thanks for having us. Christine, no thank you guys both so much. Tiffany, uh, excellent job uh, curating and moderating panel once again. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So we are going to move to our next panel. Super, super excited. Uh, we have a